Good things, probably. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game, and we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest Lenny McAllister, who knows, well, he knows a great deal about public policy. He's a relaxed kind of guy. You often hear him on the radio. You see him on the major cable outlets. Now he's on Public Affairs. And I got to say, Lenny, are you fired up? I'm fired up. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, we stole that from Barack <laughs> Obama. When he did it, it was really cool. Us, not so much. But Mr. McAllister is running for Congress. He is running in the second congressional district Republican primary. He is, um, that, and that's the special election to replace Congressman, former Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr., who resigned along about Thanksgiving? Day before Thanksgiving, actually. Okay, and so that's a vacant seat. The um, special election is scheduled for February 26th. We're taping this on January 19th, a little bit more than a month left. That's the Republican and Democratic primaries on February 26th. There's 17 candidates. Some of the mainstream media have trouble with this. They say, well, I don't know what they say, but they just have trouble with it. There are 17 candidates in the Democratic primary. There are five candidates in the Republican primary, right? Yes. Five and 17 would be 22. 22. So sometimes people say there are 17 people running in the Democratic primary. Sometimes the mainstream media say there are 21 running in the Democratic primary. Sometimes they say they're 22. They've kind of forgotten there's a Republican primary. Would that be yeah. accurate? That would be accurate. I think they understand that um, they know the history of this district. It's a Democratic district. It's been a Democratic district for the last 60 years. But I think that with the addition of Kankakee County and the opportunity for people to have a different type of congressman, somebody that, that is able to connect with everybody throughout the diversity of this district, that's been able to hit the ground running and do things within Cook County, Will County, and Kankakee County for the last several years, but then also have the residents in Washington, D.C. I think people are excited about that. But here's what they want. They want the straight, the straight scoop, I think. Yeah. We're going to give it to them because everybody's going to come on here. Well, we've had a few people. We've had... Uh, Larry Pickens, Reverend Larry Pickens, Reverend uh, Williams has been on here, and um, uh, and now we've got Lenny McAllister. We haven't had the so-called front runners. We haven't had Debbie Halverson. She says it's too far. You were able to make it out here, but she, you know, she's coming from Crete. Which is, I guess she thinks that's in Cyprus or it's, something. It's, it's a big district. If this, if this is too far, okay. I just want to let her know this is an extremely big district. And uh, you're going to have to cover some territory. You're going to have to cover some territory and represent people from all different parts of, of basically the, the, the big diversity that is the state of Illinois. So if you're watching this, people are thinking, okay, you're, everybody's telling you the front runners are Halverson because she was a congresswoman before, covered much of this area. People know her name, a lot of name recognition. Lots of relationships in Washington, lots of people to give her money. Running for Congress seriously takes mom, message, organization, and money, right? Yes. Not necessarily in that order, mostly money. Mostly money, I'm So Debbie's thought to have money. Robin Kelly's thought to have money because she's got a lot of contacts. She worked in the treasurer's office. She was a state rep. Was she was right? a state rep previously. So she had that base, you might say. If you're a state rep, you're representing 100,000 people. That's a nice base to start with. Senator Napoleon Harris, he was just elected about a week or two ago, I guess, or, well, he was elected in November, but he became the state senator officially a few weeks ago, but now he's ready to run for Congress. He's done that, he's been there, he's done that. Napoleon, come on and tell us. It's really, everybody's got a burden to carry when they run. You may have a burden, we'll come to that. Napoleon, may, people may say, well, we just elected you state senator, shouldn't you at least serve more than four days before you run for the next office? What do you say? Should he? I, I think he should. Yeah. I think there's something. At least eight days. This. After eight days, you can <laughs> run. Okay. So then, Toy Hutchinson, she's been a state senator for a while. That's her claim to fame. She's got a base, one would say, of two hundred thousand people. That's a nice start, right? That is a good start. And all all of those are in the in, in the second congressional. They're district. all in the second okay. congressional district. So, and Alderman Beal, he's been an alderman for like a third of his life. So he's a. It's only fifty thousand, but still, that's a base, and um, and others. 
There's 17 people in the Democratic primaries. We said these are the front runners. These are the people with name recognition money. A lot of a lot of career politicians that have some records to to run on. But it obviously, especially if you look at the state of Illinois, and some of these aldermanic districts with, with Alderman Beal, et cetera, some <coughs> records to run away from as well. Now you're running in the Republican primary. Yes. You're running against four others. Dr. Yep. Eric Wallace. Yes. He's somebody who's run before. He has some he has. name recognition. Yes. You worried? Not worried. We're, we're focused on the people. We're yeah. focused on the people of the district. We're focused on the needs of the district. And we're focused on showing people why we're the only candidate out of 22 that has the record of working with the diversity of the people in this district. And that's what it's going to take for the next congressman to do in order to be successful for the second district. Well, here's the thing. People view the second congressional district, I think, as kind of a vast wasteland. What is the geographic? Just give us like 30 seconds. What's covered by the second congressional district? A sliver of Hyde Park, some of South Shore, all the way down, a little bit of Will County, all the way down to Kankakee County. You're getting the, the south suburbs as well in Cook County as you go all the way What are some of those Kankakee. bigger south suburbs as you leave Hyde Park? How much of Hyde Park is in this? A, a small percentage small of it. The eastern part of Hyde Park, you get South <clears throat> Shore, and as you go out of the city... That's where you're going to be living now? Yes. Recently, you moved to South Shore, you've spent a lot of time there, but you actually haven't lived in South Shore until starting Very out, recently, right? yes, okay. and, and we were in Hyde Park for two years. But you took some time off with your family. You were on the campaign, the national campaign. Were yes. you working for Mitt Romney? I was doing a lot of media work. So I was doing stuff for CNN. I was doing stuff for Fox News, for Sirius XM oh, so Radio. So media work. So you really were on the campaign issues, but you weren't out there but trying also to with elect politi Romney. I was also working for Politic 365. So I was working from the Republican side, covering the issues, writing for Politic mm -hmm. 365. We went every place from the state of Florida, where we did a college tour there, state of North Carolina, toured with um, Americans for Prosperity What's, in Virginia okay. as well. What's Politic 365? Politic 365 is a publication that is basically online. It's similar to The Root, similar to Breitbart.com, that writes about issues from a black and brown point of view. So it gave me <clears throat> an opportunity two to three times a week to speak specifically to young voters and to minority voters throughout the country. Speak in the terms of writing for that website. Writing that for right? the website. Is it a conservative website? No, it is actually not. I was one of the few conservatives with the website, giving a perspective <clears throat> on things such Politics as... Politics 365 is Politics not a conservative website? It is is it a, a liberal website? It is pretty much leans to the left, yes. So you were like the token conservative? I was one of the people out there in the wilderness in regards to what we wrote about and what we talked about. Were there many the blacks book. writing for that oh, website? Exclusively black and brown for the oh, most part, exclusively yes. black and brown, okay. Yes. But generally, those blacks and those browns would be liberal. For the most part, You don't yes. tend to find many conservative blacks, many conservative browns. Not in the mainstream. Is that right? Not in the mainstream and mm -hmm. not with the ability to do what I was able to do, which is connect okay. and make people look at the issues for what they are and bring some things to the table. So let's cut right to the chase. The second congressional district has fairly high levels of unemployment relative to other yes. districts, fairly low income. It's viewed as an area that Jesse Jackson for a long time was trying to develop a third airport to develop Piatone. That was his dream. He thought there'd be a lot of jobs brought to that, brought to that district particularly to minorities if he could get that airport. Did I get that right? Basically. That's what Jackson was trying to do. But he failed miserably, right? Because he never even got close. Or did he? Did well, he there's get close? been a gridlock. You, you have yeah. two sides of this issue. The people of We don't have to go into details. Yes. The point is he didn't get it. The point is, is that the way to get jobs, build an airport? Or if you're a black conservative, is it to go to the private sector? Is it to get the private sector to come into the second congressional district? And if so, do you have enterprise zones? Do you look, try to lower taxes? Do you try to do things that promote economic development, but through the private sector, as opposed to saying, let's build this great airport. We're the government, and we're going to bring you jobs, OK? Do you see the difference? Yeah. Are you that type of individual, and is that the Republican brand, and is that what you're trying to sell? Don't vote for these Democrats. They give you more of the same, more high unemployment, more dependence on government. Vote Republican. Vote McAllister. Vote free market. Am I getting that right? You're getting it right, and you're getting jobs. We need private jobs to come in. And what we often see in places such as the 2nd Congressional District are people bring in entry-level jobs, but they don't bring in the jobs that get people to career <clears> jobs. <throat> so basically, the discussion becomes either raising the minimum wage or bringing more entry-level jobs into the district. What I would like to do is incent people with enterprise zones that would allow us to have an opportunity to not only bring in the entry-level jobs, but have the resources 
available to create the second, third, and fourth tertiary jobs that will allow people to have careers. Once you have that in place, when people can start having careers again, that's when they can buy their homes and not lose them in foreclosure. That's when you can <clears throat> strengthen your school districts versus seeing what we've been seeing, which is the depreciation of the home values, the depreciation okay. of the neighborhoods, going to a point of time where you start having the high crime, the foreclosure rates, and the fears in education we've had. And enterprise zones, as I understand it, are zoned areas where you're going to lower taxes just in those areas, <clears throat> and so you're going to try to develop enterprise businesses. That's why they're called enterprise and we're, zones, we're right? we're actually going to do more than that, Jeff. We're going to have something called easy-peasy zones. Basically, we want to have economic empowerment zones, but we also want them to be public safety zones. We realize that businesses will not come into these areas unless if they feel there's some type of weight behind them so that the people that shop there, the people that work there, and the people that invest there don't have to worry about some of the current conditions that are in those areas. So what we want to do is, as we're creating these zones... What are we, the conditions that they're worried about? But they're going to be worried about crime. They're going to be worried about, can, they, can these jobs <clears throat> survive in these areas longer than 18 months, two years, three years? They need mm -hmm. to be there for 10, 15, 20 years. How do you guarantee somebody, do you want to guarantee somebody a job for 10 years? Because maybe some businesses aren't good, they should fail. Businesses that, you that are good, you want to succeed. You want, you want, to, want to guarantee them, jobs? No, you want to guarantee the opportunities for those jobs to succeed. You don't want urban blight or some of the, the challenges in those areas right now to get in so the way. So what do you do to have, guarantee the well, opportunities to Well, number one, you to have succeed. to make sure that there perhaps are different types of public safety measures in place to ensure that these businesses don't have to worry about crime. Police? Don't, is that what you need? Some of it's policing. What else? Some of it may be additional laws where we work in a, in a, a partnership with the local and state governments People to say make it's sure. a hopeless thing. If you go and look, let's just stop the People say if you go into low-income areas, and that, that often is just a co-word for African-American or Hispanic, yes, there are low-income white areas, but the point is people think, and maybe they're wrong, that black and Hispanic areas are disproportionately poor. So you may have more poor whites in numbers, but as a percentage of the total number the of disparities whites... Disparities are definitely there. That's right. So if you go into a black area, you go into an Hispanic area, you're going to have less education, fewer years of education, on average. And less opportunity. You, and Lenny, less opportunity. Lenny McAllister graduated from Davis College. Lenny McAllister was a dropout that didn't start out too well, but he corrected it and he got the wisdom yes. and worked it out. But you're unusual, Lenny. There aren't a lot of there are not a lot of blacks who've come out of Davidson College in North Carolina. Am I right on that? There's not a lot of, but, okay. but there are a lot of people that have the heart to go back to school that with the opportunities that I had, I had to start out as a temporary employee making $6 an hour to work at Manpower in order to get a job at Mellon Bank, in order to work my way up. And that was after working as a deli okay. clerk for three seventy five. dollars So, so the, people, if they so have those the entry level, climb, those entry level jobs, that three seventy five an hour job was important yes. to get you to the six dollar an hour but job. But I had to have to get someplace to the else to go, to go someplace right. else, and that's what we don't have right now. We don't have the next step. No, we have but, the first but, step, Lenny, let's, but you got to put the next step. But into before place. you before you can run, you got to walk, right? Yes. And to walk, sometimes people who are not trained, who don't have a lot of skills, who don't have a lot of education, and folks, that could be a white person, okay? Yes, white people who don't have education, who don't have skills, who aren't trained, they are white and lacking those things. That's, that, those statements are irrespective of race. True. If you lack skills, you're going to be paid lower wages. Now, if blacks are on average less educated, not through any fault of their own, as we'll get to it and see, but if they have either fewer years of education or fewer years of quality education, they have more to make up. They may read less well. Again, it doesn't say anything about genetics. It says something about the way in which we give opportunities to black kids relative to white kids to learn to read, right? Which, which but my point, my point is, so we, I want to get to this minimum wage issue. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's a key issue, okay? Because people tend to think what we have to do is have minimum wages and higher minimum wages. No other, you see, people say if you watch public affairs, sometimes you see a biased point of view. Well, not really, because we challenge Republicans, as we're going to be challenging Lenny and have, and he's a Republican, but we challenge Democrats, okay? So you go to CLTV, you go to Chicago, what is it, Politics Tonight. You've been, you've been on that show, right? I have been on Politics Tonight. Paul Lisnick, okay? Bill Mahler sometimes sits in. He's from WGN mm -hmm. or CLTV and other stations. He sits in. You know Bill? Yes. So he gives a little rant the other night. He has somebody from the Heartland Alliance, I think it's called? Heartland Institute. 
Well, no, not the Heartland Justice. Institute. No, so, okay. this, is, this is the liberal organization, oh, not to okay. be confused with the conservative organization. Yes. Okay. I think it's called the Heartland Alliance. And she's babbling on about the, what we have to do is get minimum wages up. And Bill Mahler, he's not challenging her at all. Oh, no, he's saying everybody knows this, that minimum wages are the way in which you get to prosperity because people then have more to spend, and then they'll somehow help the economy. You couldn't think of anything that was more wrong, OK? Bill, have you, think, have you thought of asking somebody, any economist, 80% of them will tell you, minimum wages create what? What do minimum wages do? They, they basically keep you in that job. You, you no, have what, to, no, forget that. And it also creates you, unemployment. Yes, it, because, that's the key thing. Because you have a market small wage. businesses that end up slowly Lenny, going let's out Let's go of back business. to the yes. basics. You've taken courses in economics. Yes. You know there's a demand curve. Yes. When you raise the price of something, what happens to the quantity demanded? The demand starts going down. Yeah. The quantity demanded decreases. As you increase the price, the quantity supplied goes up. That's what you do for labor. You cut back on the demand for specific labor. You increase the supply. The difference is unemployment. Mr. Mahler, please invite me on the show, OK? Even I can tell you the basic economics. But invite somebody on the show. But somebody do something about Chicago politics. Has WGN owns that thing, don't they? They own CLTV, which is where it airs. Have they become a socialist company? Is WGN owned by the Tribune companies? Would somebody buy the Tribune? Aren't they, aren't they up for sale? They're going to sell these TV stations? Reorganize the damn thing and get some balance there. Balance, OK? You want to have liberal crud? That's fine. But let's have conservative crud. We get a conservative crud, liberal crud. It all balances out. But this is very important because you know, Bill, if you have minimum wages and you drive and, and blacks are on average, and on average they're less skilled, less educated, you price blacks out of the market more than you price whites out of the market. You'll price unskilled labor, whether it's black or white, out of the market. But if blacks are disproportionately unskilled, basically you're killing off jobs for blacks, much more than for whites. Mr. Mahler, is that what you want to do? Come on this show. Come on Public Affairs, and we'll debate. Fair and balanced, right? Yeah, and part of what we want to do with so that. So, Lenny, the whole thing, we, we I just want to, to say, the ahead. question to you is, do you want to shake things up? Are you willing to take the chance that you're... Your opponents, maybe even in the Republican primary and in the Democratic primary, certainly in general election, say, this man wants to lower the minimum wage. I don't know whether you want to do it, or he doesn't want to raise the minimum wage. He wants to hurt you. Are you going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and explain how yeah, minimum wages absolutely. hurt blacks absolutely. and hurt whites who are less skilled? Because you're, going to, you're going to take yeah, that absolutely, on. Absolutely, because okay. the solution is not to raise minimum wage and to lock people, such as the good people out there, into entry-level so jobs. To give them a it's start, to get them, get them a into the entry level, and then get them going. These are also incubators. Okay. Where you, they are the, you are the prime the example. You started yes. at three seventy-five. You started six dollars. My guess is coming out of Davidson College at, at a, ten at, years as ago. As a college dropout right. that had a child at twenty-one years okay. old. So I am. You I, overcame. I, I, you are the poster exactly. boy for the story. Exactly. Okay. We can say that. You're a black guy, but I can say poster boy, because that's the phrase, yes. OK? You want to say poster man? We'll say poster <laughs> man. But you are the guy who illustrates how somebody comes up from poverty and becomes a star. You're a star. Well, you may win this that. race, you may not, but you're on TV. You're, you're an intelligent guy giving intelligent arguments. You're somebody who you should be talking to Bill Mueller and tell him he's got it all wrong. And, and they do. And Did this, you, you, you will tell Bill oh, that? Absolutely. These You'll are tell Paul Isnick that? These because Paul's the... also gone liberal, too. That whole thing, Chicago, Paul, what is it, politics tonight? Why don't we just call it liberals tonight? But, Jeff, this, this is what I have done. I'd like to do that show, okay? This is, is what, listening. This is what I'm, I have I'm done. I'm applying to do that show. This is what I have done since moving to Chicago. I hit the ground running. Hit the ground running at WVON, at the Chicago okay. Defender, in the streets, okay. working with Ceasefire, working at Chicago State University, and bringing this type of message there and showing that how and why we have to change the methodology that we've had in place for years is not going to work. And talking about going Lenny, against the Lenny, I said I asked you some enough. challenging questions. So... You know, are you doing this just to advance your career? You're in the media. You've said you've been doing media all during the 2012 campaign. Is this an effort? This is just like a vanity campaign. You know the Republicans still won't win. You'd like the primary. You'd like to win the primary. Then you can be the guy. You can build up the name, build up your name, and then after you lose, you can go ahead and return to the media career. Well, are you said? And also, people say, you know, at best, you've lived here two years. Do you really know the second congressional district? 
I hate to use that phrase, but you know they're going to call you a carpetbagger. Well, they didn't call me a carpetbagger when I was taking on the institutions. They didn't call me a carpetbagger when I was out there walking the streets and working with caps or working with the violence. They didn't call me a carpetbagger. How carpet long have you been doing that in the second congressional district? I've been district? doing that since I got here in the second two congressional years, district two years, so. as a resident. And I've been working in Chicago since 2006 when I was working with Accenture, when I've been doing stuff with WVON. So I have ties to Chicago. They may not be as long as some of the natives here, but I've said this before and I say this again. When you look at all the native Chicagoans in this race, how has that worked out for Illinois? How has that worked out yeah. for the second congressional district with all these natives that oftentimes have been in office for 10 years and we're still dealing with all these conditions? What, what percentage of, what is it 54% of the district that's black? Uh, the second it's, closer, it's closer to about 60. Do you represent, do you represent the regular guy in the black community or do you represent the elite? Okay. I'm the epitome of the regular guy. You are. Again, if you have somebody that had a child of 21, has gone through divorce, gone through the Great Recession, that has had a mother die at 63 because of renal failure, had a okay. father that was shot at, when I was 24 years old and had to help him overcome f with that, I've gone through pretty much all the okay. issues that people in this district have experienced tell me over this. the last uh, 10 um, years. Let's say, okay, I'm, I'm a black couple now. I'm earning we're earning $30,000 a year. Okay. We're in the portion, the small portion of the second congressional district that has the kids in the Chicago public schools. Okay. Okay. They're spending $15,000 per kid per year. I've just heard the statistic that in the fourth grade, my wife and I, as a black couple, we've just heard that on the fourth grade, only 20% of the blacks read at grade level. 20%. We're afraid that our kid in that school is going to be one of the 80% that don't read yeah. at grade level. We'd like that 15000 and we'd like to send that kid to the private school of our choice. Would you give us that opportunity? I'm a very big pro-choice individual. I have railed against President Obama and his stance with the D.C. voucher program. What's the program word then? So school voucher, school of choice, you sign I'm up? definitely Everybody in the Chicago choice. public schools, they should give you, take that 15000 and go to, if they want to stay in the public schools, fine. If they want, they can go to the private school of choice. You'd sign on to that in a heartbeat? Absolutely, because competition creates the elevation of the standard. We see it in everything else. Why do we not want to apply that to education? We don't have to demonize or completely throw out the public school system, but to keep it in place yeah. as it is, well, is just, it's just flat it wrong. If people want to stay there, people think maybe half or maybe 40%, 30% like it, especially the whites who are at the elite, you know, select schools. They like it because it's basically their own private school. If they want to stay there, fine. And if, the, and if these schools, public schools, can't compete and persuade low-income people to stay there, despite the fact that 80% aren't learning how to read at grade level in the fourth grade, well, fine. But if they can't persuade them, you're saying let them go. Let right? them go. Okay. And, and let's, let's be more efficient with our educational dollars. The education issue in Cook County in Will County, in Kankakee County, is part of the national security issue that we have. If we can't innovate, if we can't have the jobs of the 21st century in this district, we cannot lead, whether it's in this district, in this state, or nationally. We have to change the paradigm of that, and we have to do it immediately. And, and to, you know, if you want to see that detailed discussion, you go to youtube.com slash public affairs TV. If you missed public affairs when we were debating that very issue with Max McGee, the former state superintendent of the public schools, Max doesn't think the way to go is school vouchers, okay? I don't know that he has an answer, but more than that, just go anytime. You can watch that show, watch Berkowitz and Max McGee go toe-to-toe -to -toe on that. Shootings, people are always, they're now, it's very much in the news, it's becoming in the news, and you know the Democrats are coming out with the traditional approach, which is what you need is more gun control. So the traditional democratic approach is if you've tried gun control, it didn't work in Connecticut, right? That was a gun-free zone. It hasn't zoning. worked in Chicago. That was a gun-free zone in It hasn't worked in Chicago. Well, yeah, it hasn't worked in Chicago. We're the murder capital of the world, right? We got gun control. You listen to Superintendent McCarthy, whatever we call him, the head of the Chicago police. What he's most proud of is the number of guns that have been confiscated, okay? Or maybe they've bought back thousands, tens of thousands. I don't know. But the point is, <clears throat> Mr. McCarthy, why do people care? If they can't walk safely down the street, if bad guys have guns, why does it help them that the good guys are turning in their guns? I mean, do you know of any bad guys who are turning in their guns? They generally don't. <clears throat> but when you start looking at the violent situation in areas such as the south suburbs and the south side of Chicago, it's not just a gun issue. <clears throat> it is also an economic issue. We have to make sure that our children can see opportunities in education 
and in the economy when they're 10, 11, and 12 years old. Their parents have to be able right. to go to work. We have to strengthen the communities economically. And they have and to they be have able to, to learn how to read. And if they yes. don't, they drop out. It's a rational thing to drop out. If you're wasting your time at a school, you're not learning how to read, what does it matter if you're in the eighth grade? You're reading at the second grade level. So you drop out. So again, you and, no and, you, join a, there, and you join a gang, and then you go and shoot people. And the people who are innocent get caught in between. So again, it comes back to school choice. It comes back to competition, to innovation, the people who are suffering. So you have to ask Debbie Halverson, maybe that's why she hasn't been here, Napoleon Harris, maybe why Toy Hutchinson. Do you think any of these Democrats are gonna come out for school choice? I mean, Reverend Jesse Jackson Jr. himself, it's kind of ironic, where did he get his schooling? He was in Washington, D.C. Did he go to the public school? No, Reverend Jackson sent him to where? St. Albans, okay? The most elite school he could be at, probably at that time cost 25,000 a year. So you know what, Reverend Jackson doesn't like school vouchers, Jesse's, and Jesse Jackson didn't like school vouchers. And yet the public schools weren't good enough for him, but he says if you're a poor black guy in Chicago, they're good enough for you, and Reverend Jackson and Congress and Jesse Jackson stood in the door and said, you black kids, you don't get to leave because the Chicago Teachers Union needs you. You know why they need you? They want you and they need you because you represent money to them. The more kids they have, the more funding they well, get. Well, we've seen this with President Obama as well. And we <clears> saw that several times with his budgets. And this is an initiative that Republicans yeah. have put in place when it came to the D.C. voucher program where we were told, well, we have to make cutbacks. And this is something that I've argued nationally as well as here in Chicago. We continue to fund Planned Parenthood from a federal level, but we want to cut back something extremely small such as the D.C. voucher program based on politics, not on <clears> good education So you policy. should ask all of your opponents Republican and Democrat, would they have supported the D.C. school voucher program? Because, folks, that's something you could have supported as a congressman because the Congress controls yes. Washington, D.C. Well, I would have been behind Speaker Boehner in putting that back into place. I think there was a lot of discussion back and forth about this, and it's very, very unfortunate that President Obama has stood on the wrong side of this repeatedly. Well, let's touch on the social issues. You raised him, gays, guns, God, and abortion. Are you pro-life? Definitely pro-life. Does that mean you think Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided, and would you like to see, would you say that it should be illegal for any abortions to occur? I, I am not for rolling back Roe v. Wade You're not. at this point in time. Does that mean that you can't be pro-life? Well, though? I think that if, there, if there's going to be any exceptions to being anti-abortion, I think rape and incest okay. are two exceptions. Well, that, to, to, Roe v. To, Wade to goes further that. than that. It basically is construed the decision basically said a woman should virtually have an unlimited right to an abortion. To the extent it didn't say that, it's been so construed and by the Supreme Court. And that I disagree with. Would you, that I disagree. So would I you like to see? Would you like to see? Would you like to see abortion illegal in Illinois, except for except for the cases of of rape and incest? That would be my personal preference. Okay. Yes. Would you like to see? You know. In, the Supreme Court has ruled basically the Second Amendment means you have a right to self-defense. The Seventh Circuit has now ruled that what Illinois is doing and not allowing any concealed carry, any program for concealed carry is unconstitutional. Put aside whether they got that right legally. Do you agree with that policy? Do you favor concealed carry? I am for concealed carry. I'm, so you I'm think a pro-Second Amendment guy. I do think that we can have some type of gun reform. I think that we need to get the semi-automatic weapons off the streets of Chicago. I do believe that young people having access to semi-automatic and automatic weapons is obviously What is semi-automatic wrong? What is We're that talking mean? about something that's going to be able to Give us a definition. To, what is semi-automatic? I'm going to go, I'm going to define that as any type of weaponry that allows you to fire off a high number of rounds in a relatively short period of time. How many, how many rounds is acceptable? We're going to continue to speak as the credits go but I very much want to thank our guest, Lenny McAllister. He's running for Congress. He is running in the second congressional district Republican primary. That primary is coming up. It's February 26th. We're taping this on January 19th. Thank you so much for coming, Lenny. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. <clears throat> All right, so right now, maybe you can buy a gun that reels, what, 60, 60 rounds in a minute? Yeah. What would you say, 20 rounds? Is that okay? I mean, we're starting to get into the numbers. I mean, at, But do you think at, that's really the problem? Look, in Connecticut, the problem was nobody was there who would have a gun. But on the streets, if there was a but on the streets of Chicago, okay. Jeff, the, the problem is that the fact that you have 12, 13, 14-year-olds that go as drug runners, and they have access to guns where they can fire off 20 they're at gonna, a time. They're going to be getting these guns anyway. You're not going to confiscate the guns. At best, you're going to ban you, the manufacturer. But if you can, you but, got 200 million guns out you, there. But if you can get to somebody 
and say, if you buy this gun legally, Lenny, do you really and, believe and that's up happening Lenny, do you really head, believe that absolutely. that's the solution? Or it's should you? It's part of the solution. I think this is more of an, in Chicago, it's more of an economic issue. If you have more economic and educational opportunities,